Mike, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you on today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was just catching up with you a little bit before we started. I would say if someone is interested in the space of strength training, bodybuilding, nutrition, uh, it would almost be impossible at this point not to have come across some of your work or, or one of your companies that you have in the space. Um, so very excited to be able to introduce you to the audience today. Uh, and if those who somehow don't know who you are, uh, I think this is, is going to be the start of an incredible resource for them moving forward. Oh boy, way to, you know, way to wave my flag for me. <laughs> I can't wait to disappoint everybody. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Nothing but letdowns here, folks. Um, well, perfect. So, uh, you know, th there's no shortage of directions. I think we could take this. Um, I've been fascinated by the things that you're doing through Renaissance periodization. Um, I haven't actually worked with the team as a, as a customer, uh, but I'd be lying if I said I haven't tapped into a lot of the free resources that you provide and make available. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I think has been interesting for me in just kind of following your career and, and your recent pursuits um, is this transition and, and focus personally on, on bodybuilding. And uh, to that extent, right, um, I've really been interested in a lot of the content that you've been putting out and discussions you've had around just hypertrophy. And I feel like this is one of those topics. Um, a lot of people don't even know what it means. Uh, a lot of folks don't understand why it would be beneficial to them or maybe what purpose it would serve in terms of helping them reach whatever their own uh, fitness related goals are. And I just thought to myself, you know what, what better person to come to to get some answers to some of these questions? Uh, oh, so if you, if you don't mind, I know I'm, I'm, I'm building you up here. If you don't mind, I, I would love to start there. C could we even maybe just start by defining like, you know, what is hypertrophy? Yeah, sure. Hi hypertrophy is the process by which muscles grow. And um, I think a lot of people will uh, understand that this, some of that is genetic. Hmm. Uh, some of us start more jacked than others. Some of it can be altered by how you train and some of it can really be altered by how you eat mm. and plus rest and recovery those are kind of the big ingredients to explain why someone is or can get more muscular than someone else yeah so what does that process look like because i feel like there's a lot of kind of misconceptions out there um as to you know how does muscle quote unquote grow um, you know, one of the most common ones that I've heard is like, oh yeah, you know, you go to the gym, you break down your muscles, you tear them down and you, you build new muscle on top of that. Um, can, right. can we talk about what's actually happening within the body? Um, because I think there's a lot of folks who maybe don't put the emphasis to your point on rest and recovery, uh, because maybe they don't actually understand the processes that are happening within the body that need to sure. take place for that muscle to actually grow. Sure. So that's not a terrible analogy. Okay. Um, not a terrible one. It's not great. I've heard it a bunch. I used to say it out loud. Sure. Um, I think muscle growth can be understood um, in a manner of seeing the body as kind of a, a computer. And hmm. uh, the computer will give you the outputs that you want if you give the appropriate inputs. So, you know, if I would like to, um, well, gee, you know, it, I actually, I, I should ask. It, it, do you have a um, – am I allowed to swear? Yeah, go, please. Am I allowed to talk about uh, obscene adult topics? Yeah, that's actually Excellent. the intent. Excellent. So if, if, if I would like to have my, my computer display adult videos for my entertainment, I am you know, going to insert a, an adult DVD into the DVD-ROM <laughs> – <laughs> by intentionally very 2002 about it and uh, you know the input is the dvd the output is pleasurable the things on my screen and of course downstream this chaos and terror in my life is i'm a recovering porn addict i'm totally kidding i'm not uh, recovering <laughs> i'm not recovering at all <laughs> i was yeah, like I was, I was like we got to switch gears here we got to take this crap. whole gotta, different direction forget about hypertrophy <laughs> yeah, about well, well, forget <laughs> hypertrophy i got something else i want to talk about yeah, no, no no current porn addict but um <laughs> in any case you know so the, the computer does all the the really 
trippy stuff of like you know it doesn't matter how closely you look at a cd or dvd you don't you don't see any porn unfortunately the, mm. the ridges don't really do any of that so there has to be some sort of process in the computer which gives us what we want yeah. now in, in much the same way you lift weights in order to actually just do a few very simple things in order to turn on the machinery of muscle growth that sits in your muscles more dormant than not so it's kind of like mm. you know the, the, the machinery up keeps your muscle size it's always breaking down your muscles it's always reconstructing them your muscles mm. every oh gee every few days are probably constructed anew and mm. um definitely completely anew every few weeks is so basically like um your body trades out old uh, malfunctioning muscle for new muscle all the time and what we want to do is we want to tilt that equation of breakdown because usually if the breakdown rate is the similar as the building rate and then your muscles stay the same size okay what we want to do is we want to shift that equation at least somewhat into the direction of build up and then so what we do is we present some kind of stimulus in order for the body to actually turn on that machinery so unfortunately yeah. it doesn't just turn it on to max tilt just recreationally for fun so mm. one of the ways in which the body can turn on the machinery the simplest way and there are a few other ways but is the detection of tension in its own muscle fibers. So if the muscle mm. cell detects a lot of tension passing through it, being generated by it, it goes, oh, gee, that's a lot of force. And uh, there are a few molecular machines that literally are designed to detect tension. And then they communicate to other molecular machines whose job it is is to orchestrate and coordinate muscle growth. So if the molecular machines designed to detect tension detect enough of it, they, they sort of wake up the part of the body, that, the part of the cell that builds muscle and go, hey, hey, you, get up, build this muscle. Damn it, there's tons of tension. And the we thing goes, oh, over right. Here. Yeah, it's got, you know, I like to think of the muscle growth machine as kind of like, like a handy mechanic with like a cigarette permanently hanging off the lips <laughs> all the time. Doesn't matter what he's doing, he's asleep, <laughs> snacks, food, mechanic stuff, cigarette, half, half half smoked cigarette always there so yep. basically these the, the molecular machinery designed to build muscle in your body is, is quite intricate but it's all there and it's all ready and it's all designed by evolution to be ready to do it it just has to have a compelling reason hmm. and what we as a species and actually all, all all mammals and pretty much all animals have evolved to do is there's two sort of evolutionary pressures one is, you know, building shit is really, really calorically expensive. And mm. food in our ancestral environment doesn't just lay around. You know, we didn't have like Hard Wegmans. You familiar with Wegmans? <laughs> Very familiar. Yeah. My God. You know, so the, can you imagine that there are people in this world that haven't been to a Wegmans? It actually, yeah, it is a, a travesty. It's I a travesty. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a crime on a global scale. Forget yeah. about yeah. Russia and Ukraine. We got to talk about there not being Wegmans <laughs> everywhere. We got to get people in Wegmans. Seriously, yeah. but just build a Wegmans in the Russia-Ukraine border, and I guarantee you everything will be totally fine. <laughs> so, um, good God. what was? How did I get to the Wegmans part? Uh, oh, we, we were talking evolution. about yeah, the yeah, mechanic yeah, with back. the skull ring. Right. Yes, was, that's right. That, that's not any helpful the... at all. So, uh, so basically evolution designed uh, all current human animals essentially to be very conserving on their energy expenditure, including intracellular. Because like if you're building muscle all the time, that costs a ton of protein and a ton of calories. It's just like there's not a ton of like filet mignon steaks laying around in nature. Right. Like it's really tough to do. So right. your body generally doesn't like to do it unless it's given a very good reason. And so if your muscles are asked to produce a lot of tension – and are pushed pretty close to their limits. Hmm. That combination with a few other things is basically telling the body through an evolutionary lens, sort of like, hey, shit's hard out here. My muscles are being used in a way that is really like, is really challenging them. Hmm. Maybe I need more of these things so that I can do this task that I'm trying to do to survive better. And the body goes, oh, fine. And it's always, always aware of the fact that it doesn't want to spend any extra calories on this process. Hmm. So sort of begrudgingly, starts to turn the gears and lets muscle growth go and complete the process. So basically you train, you present tension to the muscles. A few days later, that process is concluded and you have new muscle on your body. And hmm. if you don't train again in a few days, your body sort of looks around and goes, well, it looks like we don't need this shit anymore. Take it apart, boys. And then just take it apart back to your normal state. So in order to continue to have muscle and to build more, you know, you know every week or twice a week or even a little bit more often, you represent that stimulus that tension and that hmm. tells those molecular machines hey tell that you know giant muscle building machine in the in the in the cell to really get going and build some muscle 
And that's just yeah. how it works. You have to re-stimulate that machine all the time because it goes through its cycle in a few days and then it just shuts up and doesn't do anything because it has to have a continual good reason. It's kind of like, you know, how good are you at the spoken German language? Well, if you learn it as an adult, if you're in Germany and being stimulated all the time to speak German, you're probably pretty good at it. But right. if you leave Germany for four weeks, you're going to be rusty because it's like your brain doesn't really like to keep shit around. It doesn't use all the time. Now, your brain for sure, but your brain has memory and all this other stuff. Your body, much less so. So if you stop mm. training, gee whiz, it really starts to dump muscle fast. And that's why you have to train you know, a few times a week for the same muscle group to really keep it on track for growth and growth and growth. Yeah. Boy, bunch of things there. Number one, you made me reflect back on all the Japanese I took grade seven through junior year of college and how little I now know. That sucks. Uh, I mean, it's great that you took it and you knew it, but it sucks that you don't know much anymore. I mean, very little. I can remember how to apologize because I was late quite often. Yes. Um, and that's the most important thing to know is immediately upon <laughs> landing in Japan, begin to prolifically apologize. Sumimasen. Yeah, exactly. That's You're good. Um, but yeah, no. So there's a couple things you said there, and uh, I am glad I asked this question now. So one of the things that I've been trying to get my head around, um, and this has come up a couple times recently. So it's it's not that we're actually, and tell me when I get any of this wrong. So when you, you say, wrong. I'm just kidding. I had to say it. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> so so when you say build new muscle, um, can you clarify? what you mean by that because i was under the impression that in actuality right we only have like a, a finite amount of like i guess what, what's the right way to say this muscular cells satellite and, cells okay and that in actuality when we grow our muscles get them bigger you know put on size it's not that we've created more of those cells it's that they're actually getting larger um by a bunch of biological processes that i admittedly don't understand no, no that's okay yeah yeah so uh there's a little, quite a bit of complexity here but the simplest way i'll put it is this okay you, please you, you take the average muscle cell yeah and it, it is actually composed of what are called sarcomeres which are the fundamental units of, of muscle contraction they're like the functional equivalents uh of, of what like what actually does the work hmm. okay. so it, it's like you know, in a bowl of rice the lowest common denominator functional equivalent is a grain of rice. If we just multiply it, we get all the rice we want. But if you start cutting grains by thirds, I don't know if you get so much rice out of that whole thing. Hmm. So you have muscle cells and all of them, they look like, um, like a cable that holds up a bridge. And each one of those thick ass metal ropes is a sarcomere. Hmm. And what we do is like, we can't make sarcomeres bigger because they are only a finite size. They're actually a very large complex molecular machine and they're hmm. not scalable. So what we have to do is we have to build new sarcomeres. So we basically, inside the muscle cell, you start building a new sarcomere next to the others. When it's finished construction, it connects to everything else, and then it generates oh. force. Mm -hmm. Now, to your point, we can run out of room inside a given muscle cell. Once okay. we run out of room, it's like they basically being like, okay, so this like bridge cable, it can be like up to one yard wide, and then adding any more shit just weighs it down. So then yeah. we might have to actually build another bridge cable next to it that starts out skinny and then gets big eventually to double up on it. It's like it's, huh. only, it's only so big you can make it. So the, the way that new cells are constructed is that these cells called satellite cells are tiny and pathetic and dormant, and they just kind of sit there and don't do a whole lot. They do some regulation of muscle growth, but once we have a cell very close to that uh, a satellite cell, a real functioning muscle cell with all the sarcomeres that it can possibly jam in, it runs out of room and it goes, hey, I can't do this anymore. And then the satellite cell next to it will often turn on and hmm. start to actually accrue sarcomeres and become a real full-fledged cell that is a real working muscle cell. And then it gets really, really big. And so so, so at any time in a living, yeah, yeah, at any time in a living human that's been training for a few months or longer, cells can be in any variety of configurations. You'll always have some satellite cells that aren't doing a whole lot. You'll have some that are starting to become actual muscle cells and really big ones. You'll have some that used to be satellite cells months ago, but are now full-fledged, really giant muscle fibers. You'll hmm. have some muscle fibers that are still growing in their own accord, still ex uh, uh, um, expanding with their own sarcomeres. And you'll have other ones that are really at that limit and they're not growing anymore and more satellite cells have to be asked to do the job. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for dumbing that down. No, I, that that is crazy, number one. Yeah, Very yeah. interesting. Um, so, you know, is it fair to say, take bodybuilding, like eventually at some point for every person, a lot of that's based on genetics and their own physiological makeup. 
there is a a maximum size that they can achieve like at, at some point you know like i guess it's probably theoretical mm -hmm. um but is that to say that like there, there really is like at some point like there's a maximum size that could be achieved for any given human uh, well it's a good question you know there's certainly kind of an asymptotic limit you know, it might not be a true maximum, but it, stuff gets really hard the more muscle you build. Hmm. And, um, you know, in order to upkeep and continue to make more muscle, your body may not be able to throw more and more resources at it. There are also a variety in way, of ways in which your body limits muscle growth on purpose, again, mostly to conserve calories. Hmm. One of those limiting functions is called myostatin. It's a protein that's manufactured with seemingly its most important role, or the one we know about most, is to take the central machinery that builds muscle and essentially tell it to stop doing it as much. Now, there are uh, a variety of animals in which that myostatin gene has been knocked out, sometimes naturally, sometimes artificially. Same effect. So the I Belgian can, blue I can cow. I can see the uh, like you know the uh, the BuzzFeed article yes. examples popping up of like the jacked mouse. <laughs> yes. Have you seen the picture of the greyhound? No, I don't think I have. Yes. So I write that yeah, yeah. There's a myostatin negative greyhound, and he's un ultra jacked, but he's got a, he's a greyhound, so he's psychologically identical, and hmm. so he looks very scared of himself. It's hilarious. As a greyhounds are very frightful animals, uh, and he's just not like you'd think he'd be like confident like a pit bull, and he's not. He just has right. these huge wide eyes like, what the hell have you people done to me? <laughs> but in any case, when myostatin is turned off or not present in high concentrations, muscles can get so big that they actually become slightly dysfunctional. Their mm. amount of force they generate doesn't scale as well as you would think. Your body's so – it's almost like building a house, and the job the, – the, the builders are like – like the government showed up and was like, look. Just keep fucking building. And they're like, what, like so what kind of rooms do you want? What kind of do you want? Like a room for TV or a room for a kitchen? And they're like, just just build rooms. Just shut up and go do it. Right, Nobody's right. asking you questions. They're going to build nonsense that doesn't actually functionally make your house any better. So right. Just the same way if myostatin's turned off completely, it seems to start building muscle in a way that doesn't make you any more strong. Sometimes it can actually reduce tendon strength and all this other weird stuff. So there are definitely mm. limits to muscle growth. But we haven't found any for sure hard limits yet. Uh, they're, they're soft limits, but not so soft. So like, for example, you know, uh, your human body you know, through the actions of testosterone will only allow so much muscle growth signaling to occur and will create, will only sort of block so much muscle loss signaling. Like if mm -hmm. you want to grow bigger than that, you have to take more testosterone or other anabolic steroids. At some point you take all the steroids in the world and you're mostly just getting poisoned instead of actually gaining muscle. That's how hard that process becomes oh, wow. because all of the cell machinery is fighting it now. This is not designed to be an, uh, an uncapped process. Huh. So that being said, you have to get real jacked for that to happen. Yeah. And the biggest thing is not so much hypothetical limits to muscle, but practical ones, Yeah, especially ones like genetics. Like a, some, so that process that I just described of the satellite cells sort of waking up and being like, oh, oh, shit, let's become real muscle cells. So in different people, there could be a very different concentration of satellite cells. And they do – these satellite cells do um, – can sort of reproduce in a sense or multiply, but the rates of multiplication can be either super high or super low. The satellite cells can themselves become either very big or not so big, um, and they can grow at a slow rate or a fast rate. And then when you combine all these factors together – some people will lift weights ultra hard, eat all the right foods, get all the right rest, and you just don't see much muscle on them. Another problem is muscle breakdown. There's an entirely different set of pathways that literally break down muscle tissue in order hmm. to fix the broken stuff and also to use it for calories for the rest of the body. Like, you know, if you're starving, starving, right, and your body has the choice of, okay, either we eat up memories literally by breaking down brain tissue or hmm. we like take our biceps from 20 inches to 18 inches. They're going after your biceps, luckily right. for you. <laughs> and your, your body's not going to break down the heart muscle in order to save skeletal muscle. So yeah. a lot of times people's muscle breakdown machinery, just for genetic reasons, is really pretty gnarly. And they just mm. really just can't get that jacked. So there's a huge, huge genetic difference in how much muscle people can grow based on how their molecular machinery is aligned. Interesting. Yeah, I find myself often wondering, uh, you know, I love watching World's Strongest Man. Like it's if I'm amazing. in the gym and I'm and I'm going to throw on something as a grown man to get me motivated, that'll usually be it. Um, and at some point I'm like, man, you know, how far away are we from from 
human potential, like how strong, how big could a person actually get? And I think what you said provided like a, a good perspective. It's like, uh, is it capped? I don't know, but at some point there does become like functional limitations. Yes. Uh, even if the body could continue to get stronger, bigger, um, to what extent does like, you know what I mean? Uh, the, the other, uh, I don't know. Just just genetic the other factors. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um that's really interesting. So actually, uh, this this might be a good segue. We'll see how it turns out. But this is a question I as a as a father of 3 with a full-time job and a podcast on the side often ask myself. I'm very interested to understand, uh, sheerly out of necessi ne necessity of time, you know, what is the minimal amount of work I can do to get my desired end result, right? So if it's, uh, look, I just want to look great or I want to get a little bit bigger um, and I don't have unlimited amount of time, I'm often trying to figure out like, hey, how many sets, how many reps can I get away with doing and still getting some of that, you know, let's just say growth to keep it simple. Um, and in kind of trying to answer that question, I, I've stumbled on a couple of your articles and, and some of your work and maybe even videos where you start talking about, uh, you know, four different, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to call them categories, but you tell me how you think about it. Um, ways in which you think about volume and uh, the impact that it's actually having on your body or, mm. or whatever it is that you're trying to train. So I'm speaking specifically like maintenance, uh, the minimally effective volume. Um, could, could you talk a little bit uh, about I guess that, yeah, um, sure. that how you think about that and how maybe people like myself could think about that. Of course. So the first term to become familiar with is maintenance volume. Hmm. And, and that's the amount of volume you need to expose. Here's the amount of training you need to give your body in order for it to not get any smaller muscular wise. So like, you know, you're pretty jacked. You probably train somewhat to stay that jacked. If you were this jacked, just not doing anything, I'd be insanely impressed. Not to say I'm not impressed and uh, regardless, but, uh, you know, so you do a certain amount and it turns out that maintenance volume is actually, can actually be quite low. And then hmm. the next question is low compared to what? And the answer to that is minimum effective volume. Minimum effective volume is the least amount of training you need to do in order to get actually bigger. Now, the difference between minimum effective volume and maintenance volume in people that have been training for a while is often more than one third oh, of wow. size. So for example, if you're doing squats, three sets, three times a week, nine total sets of squats yeah. per week in order to get your quads to grow somewhat, mm -hmm. it's possible that with just three sets total per week, you could have the same size quads for years and years and years. Interesting. Yeah. So the next term after is the maximum recoverable volume. And that's right. the most volume you can do and still recover from. And that's kind of a top end cap to how much training you can do if you want the best results. It's certainly mm -hmm. not higher than that because anything you can't recover from, you probably won't grow from, especially in the long term. So for someone like myself, right? I'm, I just turned 35, you know, I, I keep myself in good shape. And I'm like, hey, look, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. I like my body composition. I feel strong. You know, I can do all the things I want to do in life. Um, for someone who maybe is there, right, and they might be concerned with just maintenance volume. Look, I, I have 20 minutes to work out three days a week. You know what I mean? And I need to make the best and highest use of that 20 minutes. What are the sorts of like reference points or indicators that they can look at to determine like, hey, I've I've honed in on what my actual maintenance volume needs to be. Is it just subjective? Like, hey, I'm still 220. Uh, my strength <laughs> is about what it was the last three weeks. Right. Or are there is there maybe a better way that someone like myself could assess that? I think the best way is the way in which you said. And hmm. really the strength is the thing that determines most of it. So what you do is you train with a certain amount of volume to, to improve. And then mm -hmm. let's say, oh, I don't know. I'll make up a fictitious example. It's summer and your kids are all back causing chaos and havoc and you just don't have time to train because you got to keep mom sane, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> that starts and you say, okay, I, I can't train the normal amount. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I heard it's like a third or even less. So I'm going to cut my, my total training volume by half. You do okay. half. And then you do half and you see – how your rep strength is affected week after week after week, month after month. Hmm. If you're still getting stronger, it's higher than minimum effective volume because hmm. you're probably still making adaptations. What you want is to get to a place where week after week after week, you are no stronger, but no weaker. 
And that might have to have some calibration, but you might start with, you know, say you do 10 sets for your quads every week, drop it to five, and you're still making gains. Slower, but you're still making them. Like, okay, let's drop it to three. And then you stop making gains. And then after a month, you actually get a little weaker. And you're like, ooh, I think the answer is four, four sets mm. of, of quads per week. You do that for a while. And for two months straight, you do four sets and you basically just make no gains, but you lose nothing. And yeah. then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, it's pretty close to, I think, I think my maintenance volume is. You could do that for every single muscle group, every body part, and it works just about the same. Hmm. So the flip side of that, right? And I, I believe, you know, stop me if I got this wrong that maintenance volume is roughly a third of the minimum effective volume to grow? Yeah. Okay. So then that that kind of my next question then would be when we start talking about, hey, look, I have a very specific goal. Um, it could be a competition, an event, or you know, whatever it may be. And I, I want to try and push that upper boundary towards that maximum recoverable volume. Mm -hmm. What are the sorts of indicators um, that someone should be looking at to determine like, hey, am I, am I over pushing it? Yeah. And I'm now veering on the side of like, you know, a couple of weeks, I'm going to be overtrained and yeah. I'm really going to be like paying for it. Yeah. There's actually one really simple one. There's a bunch, mm. but one simple okay. one does most of the heavy lifting, LOL. Um, <laughs> and that is asking yourself the question of, am I recovered for my next workout of the same muscle group? Hmm. So for example, if I train chest Monday and Thursday and I do eight sets of chest on Monday and Thursday, my pecs are still tender to the touch. Hmm. and I'm weak as shit because I'm still sore, yeah. clearly eight is too many on Monday. Next Monday, I might try six. At six sets, I heal just on time to have an amazing workout Thursday. Thursday, hmm. I also do six sets. And then I heal just on time to have an amazing workout on Monday. Everything is good. You're healing just on time. You're getting stronger week by week. Everything's awesome. Hmm. You could try to push that up a little bit and see if you still heal on time because your body gets used to stuff over time. You know, it was six for a few weeks. Maybe now I try seven sets each time. Maybe yeah. that'll work. Maybe it won't. But you could be in another situation where you say do three sets of chest on Monday, three sets on Thursday. Someone's like, hey, man, Thursday, you want to train chest? You're like, sure. You show up to their house to train chest. Oh, this already sounds like an adult film. Huh? And uh, I told you I was a porn addict. See? So, um, <laughs> you know, you show up to their house and they're like, how are your pecs feeling? You feeling good? Recovered? You don't even understand the question. You're like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, well, are you sore? And you go, well, I don't really get sore. I'm like, oh, Okay interesting do you get tired like nope i always feel great i feel great during my workout and after my workout We're like okay well i can tell you you're probably not training that hard hmm. and then if you trained more you would probably grow more so ideally you want to be training in a certain way that gets the muscles really pumped during the workout really tired and feeling weird you know how like if you try to brush your teeth after a bicep workout you like cramp and you're break one of your teeth and then you yell at the dentist and <laughs> lawyer gets involved you know how that works yeah, yeah, yeah you guys know i don't have to tell you <laughs> um, so, you know, like if you're walking downstairs after a leg workout and you just skip hopping downstairs, like nothing's ever happened, you may say you did a leg workout, but that's not really what happened. You just moved around for a while and then you called it mm. a workout. You should feel some kind of perturbation. Something went wrong with the muscle. That's yeah. rule one. Rule two is that whole bad stuff that happened should be recovered pretty close to the time you train again. So for example, even if I don't get sore at all, let's say I train biceps Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm -hmm. If I train them Monday, by the time I go to train them Wednesday, they should be feeling pretty damn good and ready to go. However, if yeah. they're feeling good all day Tuesday too, mm, I could have done more on that Monday. So the, uh, the sort of quote unquote, the perfect bicep training system is not, is not perfect, just something that works. Yeah. So if you train your biceps on Monday, they're really tired the rest of the day. Tuesday, they don't feel quite right. Wednesday, they feel great. You hit it Wednesday, Thursday, they don't feel quite right. Friday, they feel great. You hit it Friday. And Saturday, they feel meh. Sunday, they feel great. One extra day of rest really revitalizes all the systems. And then Monday, you come in and smash it again. Now, you could say, okay, well, yeah, you train three times a week, but you never said how much. Well, that's the real question. How mm -hmm. much, how many sets does it take to mess you up all of Tuesday, for example? Yeah. There's an answer to that question. It's a changing number, but it's a pretty stable number. Like hmm. very, very little, you know, it's a very small chance that I'm going to come up to you and be like, hey, you want to train chest with me? And you're like, yeah. Look, okay, just one set for the whole chest, right? You're going to be like, dude, what? <laughs> yeah, if we train again in three hours, yes. But right. 
you know, if I'm training again a half week later, that's not going to be enough. And then I could tell you, okay, okay, great. So 20 sets for chest, you're going to be like, wait, oh, hold on, 20. Uh, I may never recover from that. And, and then somewhere between those two is a range of numbers that's generally the correct answer. And that's mm. all I want, want you to get to. And that, you know, that way your own body can be the guide because some people recover from uh, volume faster. Some people recover from more volume. Some people from less. It's all tailored to the individual based on their own responses. And that's what I was just going to ask you. So it, because so here's, I, I bet a lot of people can probably relate to this. They want to improve their bench. So they go on the internet and, uh, you know, they find a six week bench workout from their favorite, uh, you know, guy who bench presses 600, pounds, whatever it is. Right. right? Um, and sometimes I look at that, I mean, I've done it too. I mean, yeah, I've probably done it a million times, but sometimes I look at all those sets and all that volume and I'm like, shit that is a lot and yeah like, what is what is the point there and i'm and i'm like well i guess like i'll try it because it worked for this guy um and i i think hearing the way you just described it makes so much more intuitive sense it is number one it sounds like recognize that it is individual uh there could be a number between one and 20 and it sounds like you, you need to listen to your body and through a little bit of trial and error and you could probably you can probably take an educated guess that's going to get you closer yeah. to that number. Uh, there's enough information out there. But it, it sounds like that that number, that volume can really depend upon the individual. And it's kind of incumbent upon you to listen to your body. Yes, definitely. As uh, hmm. uh, I think a decent analogy is like um, uh, cooking from a recipe book. Hmm. I think I think I just dated myself on that one. Sorry, going on TikTok and, <laughs> yeah. and, and googling recipes. Um, don't ever go. Hey, are you on TikTok? Uh, I'm not on TikTok. That's good. Stay the, stay off. It's terrible. Yeah. It's a terrible place where intellect dies. So in any case, <laughs> making a recipe for food. Um, hmm. You know, if a recipe says family size lasagna, and it's a you know two eggs and a pound of noodles, blah blah blah. And then you're like, oh, all right, but there's only one of me and I'm not a glutton like Mike Isratel, so I'm just going to have a third of the lasagna. What you do is you take the recipe and you divide everything by three and then like probably that'll be a fine lasagna except one third of the size. Right. So if you look at world bench press champion, you have to assume a few things. One, amazing genetics. Two, mm. dedicated lifestyle to recover as much as possible. And three, probably copious amounts of drug use that also help with recovery. So, and actually four, a really well-trained athlete who's been doing this a long time, knows the system, knows their body, has had a lot of practice recovering. You know, like if you go and play like a rec softball game, you're sort mm -hmm. of like a year afterwards because you're out of shape, piece <laughs> of shit like me. But if you start getting into a softball league, a few games later, you feel totally fine. You can play the whole game. You feel okay, right? So right, right, if right. you're starting a bench press program, don't assume that the person who wrote the program also just, that was their first program. It wasn't, there was the 90th. So what mm. you want to do is just like in a recipe, let's say, let's say three sets of bench in the program, three sets of close grip bench, and then three sets of weighted dips, and that's it. Maybe just mm -hmm. start with one set of everything. And if, and listen, here's the thing. If it's not enough, you can always do more. Yeah. Like if you do that on Monday and you're like, man, I didn't get shit out of that. Next week, do two sets of everything. I promise you'll feel something. And mm -hmm. it may be, you know, the, the athlete's really strong and, uh, and a lot of times really strong people because of the loads they're using, the number of sets they have to do is actually lower. Um mm -hmm. It's just like, look, you do a fucking rep with 600 pounds, motherfucker. If you did that, you'd be sore for a year, but you can't. <laughs> right. can. So what you're, you know, when you put your 100 pounds on that shit, maybe you need five sets. He needs three. So it may actually be that you need more volume than that guy. But if you start on the lower end of things and then increase the volume as your body tells you that you can recover, it's just like making uh, you know a lasagna for the first time and saying, hey, look, you know, like I'm just going to make a third of it. And like, if you're still hungry, make it again. But it's yeah. important that when you're making it again, you realize there's you're the only person making lasagna. You're the only person at home. You don't even like the TV shows that you're watching. You're hopeless and alone and no one's coming to help you. That's really the message here. Uh, yes. Yeah, stay in school, kids. Stay and, in school. Uh, <laughs> don't make lasagna by yourself. <laughs> oh, perfect. No, this is, uh, I mean, uh, in a very weird way, very helpful. Um, <laughs> so what, one of the things that you said, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into that because I think and now I'm speaking from personal experience, but when I talk to, to friends, family who are trying to get into working out and they're trying to get a sense of like, hey, am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? You you said a couple things there. It's like, hey, look, you have a hard bench workout on Monday. You're still sore to the touch on Tuesday. You feel great on Wednesday. Like that's a good indicator that like you're getting close to like the right amount of work. Are, are there any other kind of indicators? I keep saying indicator, but indicators like that 
um, that people can use to kind of gauge whether or not um, they're getting honed in on the right amount of work? Yeah, one that you can use in the session itself. Okay. Oh, hold on. My battery is very low on my device. Let's see if I can James Bond the shit really quick. Uh, come on. All right. We're in the green. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So one you can use in the session itself pretty reliably is how much of a pump are you getting? Hmm. So generally speaking, pump has been linked to being part of what causes muscle growth but also the damage and like lactic acid and other byproducts to generation that occurs during really hard training that grows you hmm. also causes a pump as a byproduct. So you can kind of, if the amount of training volume that you need to grow is like a glass, the pump is kind of like how much water you pour into it. If your pump is so big that you're like you're like i swear to god my packs are going to rip open and just like muscles going to shoot out right you probably overdid it in most cases oh you're just interesting ultra sore for way too long hmm. especially if it's your first time doing this program okay but if you don't get any pump at all you probably did way too little hmm. so what i would say is like once you have like a decent pump like oh shit yeah yeah my biceps are looking pretty pretty uh they're feeling pretty tight yeah then i would say like that's a good time to cut it off go home rest, eat, et cetera, repeat, see how sore you got or how tired you got, see when you feel better. Yeah. And then for next week, you can say, okay, well, this amount of pump gave me this much soreness, then I'm just going to do a few more sets and it'll be perfect. Hmm. So uh, I think that pump is really helpful because okay. that first week that you're doing a program, I mean, like you could have no idea how close to the target you are if you don't have something in the session to proxy like a pump, you know, you're like, mm. oh, hey, like you want to do another set of squats? You're like, I, I don't know. Maybe it turns out that you already six sets too many of squats and you can't walk for a week and a half uh, or you're just being a wuss. And it was sort of easy the whole time when you have a, a nice pump going, it's probably time to leave the gym, at least in that first week. So you can see how well you recovered. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm doing some reflecting, hence the dramatic pause. So it, it almost feels like, you know, if you're someone who is really you, you're interested in pushing it. And you want to actually, you know, what do we call it? The, the maximum recoverable volume. It almost feels like at some point you've had to push it too far to understand where to bring it back to. Yes. Because otherwise it's like, uh, I'm always kind of leaving a little something on the table. I don't know if it was, to your point, an extra set, two sets. Um, I don't know. Any any initial thoughts to that before yeah, I tell Thomas, everyone to go out and kill themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way you're after listening the, to me the talk. The thought to that is always start on the low end. We always start yeah. at the minimum effective volume or pretty close. Mm. And then as you figure out that you can actually train a little more, do a little more. And then do a little more. And then do a little more as your body says, hey, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And then what you're going to be doing this entire time is training, getting a pump, getting sore, repeating. And your body's going to be getting stronger. So you're going to throw an extra rep or an extra five pounds on the bar every week, every other week, something like that. Yeah. Maximum recover volume is really detected quite well when you stop getting stronger. And also when you're really, really fatigued and you feel the burden of the program. Uh. Because you stop getting stronger, that oftentimes means that you are no longer recovering. The sports science definition of recovery is a return to past performance. Like if you were weaker than mm. you were last week and you're beat to shit, it's pretty obvious that the reason you're weaker is because you're beat to shit. And yeah. then, ta-da, you're doing too much. Uh, what you did last week was more than you could recover from from this week. Thus, it's your maximum recovery volume. So yeah. I would say just keep going. And then when you really hit a strength plateau and maybe even get weaker, while at the same time doing very high volumes, being very dedicated and just feeling sore and beat up all over your whole body, well, gee, you know, maybe it's just an off day. So I say come back later that week. So for example, I'm doing 10 sets of chest on Monday. Last week, mm -hmm. I did nine sets of chest on Monday and nine sets on Thursday. This week, 10 sets. I do my 10 sets, but my performance is crap. Like I'm literally weaker than I was the week before. I'm like, okay, maybe nine sets was just over my maximum recoverable volume. Hmm. But maybe I'm just having a bad day. You know, my wife yelled at me before right. I left. She made fun of the shape of my penis again. <laughs> Not the first again. time. And it, and it won't be the last. <laughs> so I'm upset. I go to the gym. I look down, clearly a misshapen penis, and I just underperform. <laughs> but then, but then maybe I say, okay, but maybe I was just in my own head too much. I got to try it again. So we recommended yeah. RP 
is going back Thursday for your chest workout and saying, okay, let's see if the shit works. And mm. then if Thursday you're again underperforming, your muscles are still sore, still beat up, then yeah, duh, it's too much. And then it's time for what we call a deload, which is a week of intentionally super easy training to just let you recover. So that next week after you can go back to what's roughly your minimum effective volume and start that slow, gentle climb all the way back up to your maximum recoverable. So I'm glad you brought that up with deload. Oh, excuse me. With deload weeks, are you, are you taking a deload week based on, um, I don't want to say feel, but like, you know, a lot of, a lot of programs, right? It's like, Hey, every fourth week is going to be a deload week. Yeah. When you are either training for yourself, uh, gearing up for a competition or when you're working with an athlete, um, do you allow for like more flexibility based upon how the athlete is feeling? Yeah. Um, or, do, or do you tend to stick to a more like strict, rigid schedule? Well, so the answer is both. The answer is both. Okay. Funny enough, right now I have um, Dr. James Hoffman, who's my co-author on most of my books. He's probably yeah. one of the world's experts on, on recovery. Um, mm. He actually wrote the section in our book describes exactly this. But so I think question, I'm listening to that book right there, now. There you go. There you go. So <laughs> some the, the, loaded questions here. <laughs> right. The, the, the question is really like, or do we use auto-regulation, which is sort of quote-unquote going by field, or do we use pre-planned strategies mm. for deloading you know like week four is a deload right right and it, it's less of a versus and more of a both mm. um so uh basically you plan because let's say you're an experienced athlete or lifter you know yourself they said like i know that like four weeks of increasing training difficulty is all my body can take you, generally the fifth week is a giant disaster so i'm just going to plan to deload the fifth week mm. But maybe you're really feeling your swag at the end of your fourth week and you're like, fuck this, I got another, then do it. Hmm. Maybe after week three, you're like, yeah, I'm going to die if I do another week, then just right. deload on week four instead of week five. Yeah. So it's both play a factor. If you're an athlete with a distinct competition schedule, you don't play as much uh, of, a, of an auto-regulation game because like, look, like for a bodybuilding show, generally to look your best, it has to be at the end of a deload week. Mm -hmm. So that means you probably shouldn't take a deload week two weeks before because then you have two deload weeks in a row. And then you're just not as jacked as you were supposed to be. And you're like, people are like, oh, I thought you looked better last week in those pictures. Like, God damn it, I did look better. Fuck. <laughs> I did look better. Because like, I totally missed time my shit. So here's a place you don't want to be. Yeah. Three weeks out of a bodybuilding show, you are in total dog shit shape. Like, I'm sorry, you look good, but you are just overreached like crazy. You are way under recovered. Right. Like, that's a bad idea. Because then mm -hmm. if you take a deal a week the week after, then what do you do the week before the show? Uh, deload again? There's just kind of no right answers there, right? Yeah. So ideally for athletes with very distinct competition schedules, like let's take, um, oh, hey, the Winter Olympics are on TV now. So, you know, Winter Olympians that compete, let's say the ski jump people compete six times a year. One of those is the world championships. They kind of know their deload weeks literally a year in advance. Mm -hmm. Olympic sports, they usually make what's called an annual plan, which is exactly okay. what it sounds like. One year ahead plan of everything. Wow. Now, of course, there's some adjustment within that, but generally like a deal of weeks, a deal of week. Because you they've can't got set times time. they're gonna peak. Exactly. So they need, yeah. Exactly. For the rest of us, we should probably have a general idea of how mm -hmm. many weeks we can survive. And then at the margins, we can auto-regulate it. It's kind of like um, let's say you're going to uh, uh like a dance club with friends. Uh, you know, like you show up there at midnight and the club closes at four and one of your friends is totally psychotic, super addicted to like dance music, and they're going to have to be there for at least two hours. Well, so that doesn't really answer the question of are we leaving at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., or 4 a.m.? Well, the pre-planned is like if someone's like, hey, can you be at this like diner at 3 a.m.? You're going to be like, well, I can't. I, I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure, but let me tell you later, because at 2 a.m., you come up to your drunk friend, you're like, hey, Stacy, you want to go home? She's like, shut up, I'm dancing. You're like, fuck it, we're here till four, <laughs> right? Or you get into the music and you're like, hey, I want to be here till four, or it's just a shitty night and things suck and there's a fight that breaks out, and at like, you know, 2 p.m., <laughs> you are 2 a.m., everyone leaves and you leave and thank God, right? So it's kind of like, we have a general plan, we sort of know right. what to expect, and then at the margins, we can adjust if needed. Got it. That makes perfect sense. I don't think there's any need for any further questioning on uh, on my part you know, on You'll that get an topic. Email being like, can I get a more dance club analogies? Yeah. Can... Hey, the, what dance club? Because uh, <laughs> it sounds like a fantastic time. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, man, I, I got a bunch of things I would love to ask you. So let me let me narrow it down. And, and since we brought up peaking for bodybuilding, there's 
this is going to be a little bit of switching gears, but it's something um, that I've always kind of been interested in. And I feel like I get varying answers depending upon who okay. I talk to, to put it lightly. Uh, so I've, I, you know, people seem to have very strong opinions on whether or not you can both be building muscle and burning fat at the same time. And in my mind, I see bodybuilders and I'm like, well, then what the hell else are these guys doing? Uh, but I wanted to pose that question to you, you know, like it, are they two kind of like conflicting processes with different demands? And so it's not really feasible to do both well at the same time, or um, is it absolutely very possible? Um, you just have to be prescriptive in how you approach it. Mm hmm. Oh, I got all kinds of analogies. So yeah, let's go. Uh, take take me to the club, I'll Mike. Just get right to the analogy. That's right. Well, <laughs> so so uh, similar to asking the question of can I be very comfortable and also travel at the same time? Hmm. So first of all, um, if you want to build muscle and burn fat at the same time, if you want to really meticulously plan out your life and your nutrients and get a super rigid diet, super rigid workout schedule, do everything right, get lots of sleep, it is possible. So mm. would you just paying a cost there? Um, like, you know, do you, if you want to be comfortable and travel, you sure as hell can get a first class ticket to go to Hong Kong. You will be very comfortable and you will also be traveling at the same time. It is not mm. an easy thing to do. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, in most of us, when we travel, we take a bit of a hit to the discomfort. So just the same way, you know, if you're building muscle, it's probably best to just focus on building muscle. That's how your body does it best. If you're burning fat, it's probably just best to hold the muscle you have and burn fat. So, you know, if you really want to be comfortable, that means you're not going anywhere. If you really mm. want to travel, that means you're okay not being super comfortable for a while, right? Yeah. You can do both at the same time if, for example, you're new to training. And the analogy there is like your bar for what is comfortable is really low. Like we pick up a fucking caveman who's never seen civilization. We put him into a regular American Airlines just you know uh, economy class seat he's gonna be like oh my god the surface is so soft what they right. bring me drinks and food i've never been this comfortable in my life right, right. so he can absolutely be comfortable and travel at the same time it's a really low bar for entry so people say like yeah i can burn my you know burn fat and uh gain muscle at the same time and then you look at their body you're like well there's not a whole lot of evidence that you did any of that because you're still small and fat but they're hmm. like well it used to be smaller and fatter like i got you the, the, we call that sort of noob <laughs> gains right so as yeah. a beginner you can absolutely do both at the same time but yeah. there are in many ways antagonistic processes I'll, I'll put it to you this way the cellular regulating machinery that allows most of your muscle growth to occur hmm. at many levels senses how many uh how much nutrient exposure the cell has which is another way of saying are you eating mm. a ton of food mm. and if it senses there's lots of nutrients around it'll allow muscle growth to occur very well if it senses there's not a lot of nutrients around it'll dampen muscle growth significantly because remember that whole shit we talked about earlier with evolution if your yeah. body thinks you're starving which is what it thinks when you're losing fat and eating fewer calories but it's not really prioritizing muscle growth a whole lot and if you really right. slam great nutrition and super hard training you may be able to get some again if you are relatively a beginner and bodybuilders the way they do it a lot of times is they'll take a crap load of drugs and yeah with what you go from taking no drugs to a ton of drugs you can do all kinds of crazy shit. it yeah. comes at an expense to your health and longevity and all that stuff so what i would say is can you build muscle and burn fat at the same time in many cases the answer is yes hmm. it's more answer of yes as if you've never really lifted much or dieted much or taken dr drugs a whole lot the answer is more like not really if you've already been doing those things for 10 years uh and then the second answer is yeah you can anywhere from yes very much you can or if it's very difficult but is that your best bet is that mm. ideally what you want to do um you know can you imagine you know, picking up your relatives from the airport and you pick them up in like a limo and they're like, oh my God, we're going to go to your house. They're like, nope, we're going to drive this limo around for two days while you're here. We're going to be comfortable and travel at the same time. They're going to be like, mm, you could have picked us up in like a bicycle. And if you just drove us to your house, we could be really comfortable and you could have driven us back. Right. So a lot of times trying to get the best of both worlds is a bit of a fool's errand. It's, it's, it's going to take you the same amount of total time anyway. I recommend splitting it into two phases, a muscle gain phase and a fat loss phase. And does the order matter? Like is, uh, is that order generally like, you know, like, let's say you have a, uh, an aspiring bodybuilder. I, I don't know why I'm focusing on bodybuilders. I just feel sure, like sure. it's such a great physical representation yeah, of yeah. people who've built a lot of muscle and yeah. don't have a lot of fat. Does, is that kind of like the process or uh, the order that you would recommend? 
so well uh, it depends on how much body fat the person is carrying and what they want to look at the end of all this mm. so if you're carrying lots of body fat sometimes it's easier to do the fat loss phase first because then you look cooler it motivates you a lot to keep gaining muscle because during the gaining phase you'll have to gain some fat along with muscle if you're mm. already fat to start with just psychologically you might not be interested in getting even fatter um so maybe you start with a fat loss phase and then do a muscle gain phase Got now on it. the other hand uh, you could do the reverse if you're already quite lean and if you come to me and you're nine percent body fat anything below 10 percent for a male makes them less likely to gain muscle they just regain fat when you feed them again so if you come really? to me and I, oh yeah if you come if you they've done a few studies on bodybuilders where they measure muscle gain after a show until the guys get to 10 percent or above they don't actually gain any new muscle they just gain fat and they're, they're eating and training they're trying desperately but it just doesn't happen because wow. your body it goes into sort of like panic mode and being like holy shit you did it you starved us to death fuck you right. we're gonna make you as fat as we need to feel confident again right like that's basically your body's like i don't like being a body does not like being lean it doesn't like being on the edge evolutionarily it detects like eh, this isn't good this isn't good we need body fat again so it'll build that back up it'll prioritize it over muscle so if you come to me and you're nine percent fat I say, hey, should I cut first or should I, or fat loss first or should I do muscle gain first? They'll be like, fat loss to what, motherfucker? You want to step on stage? Nope. Just gain the muscle first and then you can cut, burn the fat off and you can gain a few pounds of muscle and then come back down to 9% or something like that. Ah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know what I love about this? Um, so much of this stuff can be so incredibly complex. I mean, like, you know, e even one of the first questions I asked you, I'm like, well, like, you know, how does muscle actually grow? You're like, oh, well, how do you want to It's only so simple I can make that. I didn't want to insult you by being like, well, imagine two glasses. One is orange <laughs> juice. One is grape juice. <laughs> but, but what's so amazing about all this, too, is it's like, look, we can also take this up to a more macro level and say, hey, what is your body trying to do? Your body's trying to survive. Yes. Right? It is trying to keep you alive. It's trying to, like, protect from the downside. Um, you know, and so like when you look at it through that lens, you're like, oh, of course, right? you know, like once you've gotten really lean, your body's going to prioritize, like making sure you're able yes. to survive the next time you don't have food for an extended amount of time. Yeah. Um, you can you tell know. what your body prioritizes by looking at the population and seeing where do people accidentally end up if they don't pay attention? How many people mm. have you known that accidentally end up really fat? I mean, tons. It's like half the people I know, like yeah. oops, Cheetos. How many people do you know that accidentally gained a shitload of muscle and lost a ton of body fat? <laughs> well, that would be amazing. You're like, mom, right. what the hell is wrong with you? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Um, well, hey, this this has been amazing. Like I said, I, I could ask you questions for hours, um, but I know you got to run. So there's, there's no shortage of places that people can find you. But for people who want to know more about what you're doing, um, I'm certainly going to link to Renaissance Periodization. I know you have a couple other projects you're working on, but you know where where can we send them? Yeah, thank you so much for offering to send to send me people new recruits yeah. as we call them. I'm just <laughs> Your microchip will be implanted. You will stand in line. The usual. Um, <laughs> okay. You're all going to be mechanics. By the way, <laughs> sweet cigarette hanging out. So I would say the best place to send folks is YouTube hmm. and uh, just Renaissance Periodization on YouTube. Uh, they can try Mike Isratel on YouTube. Dr. Mike Muscle Growth is probably the simplest thing to type in to for sure get to the RP YouTube channel where all of our videos are. We make like four or five videos a week. They're informational and sometimes uh, my attempts at comedy uh, probably fall flat. But like if you try to type in Renaissance, you may realize you don't know how to spell that. I sure uh, yeah. And yep, my last guilty. name is impossible to spell. So uh, just Dr. Mike Muscle Growth and gee whiz, you know, first first couple hits have to be something related to that shit. Perfect. Perfect. Well, awesome. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for all that you do. Honestly, the, I know that uh, Renaissance is doing really well. Um, but you guys put out so much free content and you've put out so much content over the years. Uh, I mean, it, it, it truly is a help to people who are motivated and want to get better. So uh, we really appreciate it. Um, but thank yeah, we'll, you have so to, we'll, much. Ha we'll have to have you back. I would love to as long as we can continue this, you know, speaking about uh, DVD porn and stuff like that. I mean, that's, you know, why talk about anything else? Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you.